The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. This week on the Court TV Podcast, we welcome back Michael Ayala to the Court TV family as he joins me for an in-depth look at events in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Was the shooting of Jacob Blake by police justified? And how will the state handle the self-defense claims of Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old who crossed state lines and ended up killing two protesters and wounding another with an AR-15? This is the Court TV Podcast with Vinnie Politan. Welcome to the Court TV Podcast. I'm Vinnie Politan. So great to have you with us uh, today. And we need to talk about Kenosha. I never thought I'd be saying those words. We need to talk about Kenosha, Wisconsin, but obviously we do. That is the epicenter of everything that is happening right now. Um, and, and there's a couple of stories out of there that we're going to get to, but I don't want to do it by myself. I, I, I need some help with this one, and I need experience. I need passion, and I need someone who is back with Court TV. He was gone for way too long, but now Michael Ayala has rejoined Court TV as its newest uh, anchor with a lot of experience. Uh, Michael, great to have you back aboard Court TV, first of all. Vinny, man, it, it is, I cannot tell you how great it is to be back and be doing, uh, to be doing what we what we do on a daily basis. Um, to me, it's just the highest calling and I'm really enjoying being back. And I want to thank you, especially for your warm welcome. Now, you are a lawyer. Yes. Just so people know, I like to get it out there, right? Uh, a lot of us here at Court TV uh, are lawyers. We, we've, we've, We've taken the bar. We've gone to law school. We've practiced law. Um, let me ask you first uh, about um, the Jacob Blake case, okay? Okay. In Kenosha, the shooting of Jacob Blake. The first time that you saw the video, the first video that went viral, what did you think? What was on your mind? Uh, what sort of reaction did you have? All right, Vinny, when, when you ask a question like that of me, I, I want to clarify, are you talking about me as a person yes. or me as a journalist and an attorney? You as a person, first of all. Okay. I think that's important. All right. First of all, it was it was outrage, Vinny. Um, as a person, a person of color in this country, um, the video when it was presented, and I think I saw it like everybody else, I might have come across it on Facebook and, and various places. Um, and, and it just, to me, fit into this narrative that we have going in this country where people of color are not given the same leeway in situations with police. When I first saw it, I said, you know, hey, here's this guy. He's not following commands, but he did not look like he was presenting any real deadly threat. He didn't look like he deserved to be shot and then to be shot in the back and then to be shot seven times. Um, there was outrage. And I, I just felt like, you know, it has gotten to the point now where something definitely has to be done. Now, is it difficult because you're a lawyer, you're a journalist as well. Is it difficult for you to look at that story any differently in, in, in any way? Because I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Not exactly, but I, I understand where you're coming from. Obviously, I, I, I can't understand exactly uh, the way you see it and the way you reacted to it. But is it possible then to take a step back and then try to analyze the law, the facts, the circumstances. I mean, how difficult is that? It, it, it is difficult, Vinny, but it's what we do. It's what, it's what we do as journalists. That's what I have to do. And there's no question that, you know, who I am as a person, how I was raised, the way I have to walk through the world um, is going to affect the way I see things, but I do the best I can to remain objective. And, you know, over the last few days, that has, that has been challenged because as more and more information comes out, um, there are conflicting parts of me that are debating the outcome of this situation. Um, the more we learn, the more we see with the new video angles, the more we're learning about the narratives that are being put out there by you know, other organizations, police organizations to be specific and, and, and various individuals, um, it's causing me to rethink the outcome of the situation. But I will, let, let me just say one quick thing though, as a person and as a journalist, I am beginning to say and think that at some point, the responsibility has to shift to the folks who are being arrested. So 
I looked at that and I said, you know, at some point Blake has to say, I got my kids in this car. This is a dangerous situation. Why don't I just stop and just deal with what I have to deal with instead of pushing the narratives because we know how they end. So I'm, I'm, I'm combating these, these conflicting feelings. And, you know, unfortunately in the black community, it's difficult to express anything that falls outside the party line because then you're branded as something other. You know, you're branded as someone who's towing the line for, for the corporate world or for the white world or the legal world or the law enforcement. So it's difficult, but, but this is how I feel. So you talked about more information coming out, right? So the video comes out first on Sunday, and, and, and obviously there's, there's that reaction that you spoke about to the video. Let's take a listen to the uh, Attorney General of Wisconsin filling in a few details surrounding all of this. Not a lot, but a few of the details. During the incident, officers attempted to arrest Jacob S. Blake, age 29. Uh, law enforcement deployed a taser to attempt to stop Mr. Blake, uh, but the taser was not successful in stopping him. Mr. Blake walked around his vehicle, opened the driver's side door, and leaned forward. While holding on to Mr. Blake's shirt, Officer Rustin Shesky fired his service weapon seven times. Officer Shesky fired the weapon into Mr. Blake's back. No other officer fired their weapon. The Kenosha Police Department uh, does not have body cameras, and therefore the officers uh, were not wearing body cameras. Okay, so there are some of the details, and not a lot of details, Michael, which is interesting. But more details, or alleged details is what I'm going to call them, came from the police union. Because the police union, as we know, as a union, they're going to represent the interests of the police officers involved. But they came forward and uh, released a statement and put a lot more into it. So I wanted to, to walk through that and, and ask you a, a couple things. Like the first thing is, um, you know, how much weight do you give a statement coming from the police union? Uh, and then number two, let's presume that this stuff is true. And we're just presuming for the purposes of what does it mean if what they're saying is true, right? Because I think it's going to be contested. Uh, they say the officers were dispatched to the location due to a complaint that Mr. Blake was attempting to steal the caller's keys or vehicle. Officers were aware of Mr. Blake's open warrant for felony sexual assault, third degree, before they arrived on scene. Okay, let's, let's, First of all, I'll, let's answer the big question. Um, as we go through this entire police union statement, uh, your thoughts uh, about the weight that at this point should be given to this statement? You know, um, police unions in this country, as we you know discuss some of the issues surrounding police departments across the country, police unions have been cited as one of the major problems. Um, they will back and protect their people almost to a fault. And what we're finding is that a lot of their attitudes towards the people they're policing are not necessarily positive. So how much weight do I give it? I give it very little weight. Um, I don't know where they're getting their information from. I don't know, uh, you know how they have come to certain conclusions. If you notice throughout the document, they're using inflammatory words that have they could have chosen different words. So they're trying to paint it in, in a direction that serves their client, because I consider the police in this instance their client. Um, so it's the same way that I would give a defense attorney's statement. I mean, that they, they have a purpose in releasing it. They're trying to accomplish something, and that's to create a narrative that works for their, their client, their, their, uh, the folks that they represent. And, and that's how I look at it. Okay, absolutely. So as we go through this now, though, I want to go I want you to go against your gut. Right. And just let's just presume that these facts are true and what they mean legally to the case and the investigation and whether or not uh, they will or will not lead to charges. So those first facts that they're responding to a complaint that Jacob Blake was trying to steal the vehicle and they knew that he had an open warrant. Uh, how does that I impact the investigation here into whether or not charges should be brought. Well, you know, initially we thought, Vinny, or at least the narrative was that he was there as sort of a bystander, not a bystander, but his only involvement was trying to make peace. He was trying to break up a fight between some other people, and he was just offering information to the police. He was not involved in it. So the fact that he was involved in it changes my perception of it a little bit and says, hey, now he's a participant in this situation, not just somebody who's helping out. 
So I, you have to look at it that way. Then the knowledge of a felony warrant also raises the level of concern for the police. So I'm willing to say when they arrive on the scene that they're a bit heightened because they're dealing with a felony warrant. They don't know who this individual is, what he's capable of, what he's about. All they know is that he's involved in a situation that he shouldn't be, shouldn't be involved in. He's trying to steal something from someone and he has a felony warrant. So as they arrive to the scene, there is this heightened level of concern, this heightened level. And they, 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 they arrive with that. So I'm willing to now accept that as being, if we're accepting what they say as true or what the police union has released as true, I'm willing to accept that they arrive in the scene with a bit of a heightened sense. And I have to remind people because people forget very quickly, unfortunately, and I've noticed this in some of the videos I've posted, but again, we are making a presumption here. Okay. We are taking a look at what each side is saying here. And right now it's the police union that is speaking and we're presuming what they're saying is true. It may not be true. It will most likely be contradicted by eyewitness testimony and perhaps the statements of Jacob Blake himself. Okay, the silver SUV in the video was not Mr. Blake's vehicle. Mr. Blake was not unarmed. He was armed with a knife. The officers did not see the knife initially. The officers first saw him holding the knife while they were on the passenger side of the vehicle. The main video circulating on the internet shows Mr. Blake with the knife in his left hand when he rounds the front of the car. The officers issued repeated commands for Mr. Blake to drop the knife. He did not comply. All right. Not his car. And he's armed with a knife that they see. How, if that is true, if that is true, how does that impact the investigation into criminal charges against the officers? Yeah, you know, Vinny, at this point, if that is indeed true, now if we presume that that is true, the car was not his, and that he was there to steal the keys, which in turn means he probably wanted to take the car, now that gives me complete pause in my initial um, interpretation. Because now we have children in a car that do not, in a car that does not belong to him, and he has taken keys, or at least attempted to take keys, to go into this car, he's trying to get in, and the police now can be seen as protecting life because m one of my big issues was even if he had a knife, I never saw any position where there was um, deadly uh, force used or they were in fear for their lives because when they shot him, he was had his back turned to them. He was shot in the back and he was reaching into the car. So a more prudent approach would have been to back up and give him a second to see what he's doing um, before you just shoot him because again, I didn't see any deadly threat, but given the facts and circumstances as presented by the police union, now you have him going into a car with a knife and with keys that he just took for a car that does not belong to him that has kids in the car. Perhaps they feel like they're protecting the lives of the children. They are allowed to use deadly force if they're protecting the lives of someone else. And in this case, that would be the children. So in that instance, I think they have a stronger leg to stand on. I'm not saying that it absolutely absolves them from what we see on that tape, but it explains more. Final fact I'll throw in here. The union is alleging that Mr. Blake forcefully fought with the officers, including putting one of the officers in a headlock. They also claim that they uh, tased him twice and it had no impact on him. They drew their weapons, and he continued his um, actions of noncompliance, not dropping the knife, not stopping, and continuing to walk around the car and into the car. If all of those facts are true, that he uh, put an officer in a headlock and, and was tased twice unsuccessfully and was armed and continued to walk away, does this look like a case if we presume all of that is true, and it's a big if, capital I, capital F, right? This is one side. Should there be criminal charges under those circumstances? Or will there be criminal charges under those circumstances, which is probably more important? All right, there's two. Should there be and will there be? Um, should there be? Absolutely. I still don't think that anything that's mentioned in that tape um, should have resulted in a death sentence for this man. He did survive. Okay, but it was seven shots in his back. I'm sorry. Should or, or well, you know, getting shot seven times in the back ended up uh, paralyzed from the waist down. None of that should have should have happened. 
as a result of his actions. There was nothing that he did. The police end up in these situations often where, you know, people don't want to be arrested. They, they have to end up wrestling with them, fighting them. We see videos of these on the internet all the time. Now, he did not respond to commands. Okay, I see that. He was, you know, had a little tussle with the police. I see that. That alone to me does not suggest that the gun should be out. They did try to tase him. It didn't affect him. Okay. Now I understand perhaps initially I was concerned as to why the guns came out. But then if you try to tase him a couple of times and that doesn't work, now you're trying to ask questions of yourself as a police officer. What do I have? A guy on drugs here. He's not responding. He's impervious to pain. I'm un un unable, unable to subdue him. Maybe they felt there was, a, you know, he had a little strength there. So the guns came out. I do understand that. But again, um, at what point do they are they able to pull the trigger? I still don't see any point on that tape where he presents a deadly threat to them. Now, again, that's of course understanding that perhaps they thought they were protecting the lives of the children in the car. If they wanna argue that, then they may have a leg to stand. All right. This is only half of what's happening in Kenosha. And obviously this started it all. But then what we saw is a Sunday night, there was rioting in Kenosha. And now we've got another case involving another shooting in Kenosha. This one involves a 17-year-old who comes from Illinois to Wisconsin and is part of some informal militia that kind of formed to protect local businesses. And he ends up shooting three people. He's been charged in that case. We'll talk about that when we come back. Follow Court TV live over the air, uninterrupted. If you're watching television with an antenna, just rescan your channels now to add Court TV. And go to CourtTV.com to see the exact channel position and more ways to watch Court TV in your area. So after the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, there's rioting in the streets, there's, there's fires, there's businesses being burnt down. And somehow, some way, some informal militia was formed or communicated. I don't know if it was through social media, how they all got together. But all of a sudden, there are a bunch of, of guys, and I don't think there were any women. I didn't see any uh, from the videos I looked at. A bunch of guys with, um, they call them long guns. I think AR-15, some of them had. And they were in Kenosha while the demonstrators slash rioters are in the streets and they are protecting businesses. But inevitably, you know what's going to happen. There's going to be, there's going to be a conflict. And there was, and it was deadly. And, and now a 17 year old, his name is Kyle Rittenhouse, a 17 year old from Illinois is now charged uh, with shooting three different people, three different people. He's 17 years old. I mean, wow. Uh, but but let's get beyond and 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 Michael Ayala is still with us, Court TV anchor. Michael, I I think it's another discussion for another day. Why a seventeen year old is there? I want to I want to save that for another time because that's going to send us. Uh, we're going to run out of time because our, our my producer is going to give me a rap cue, right? Because because he, he, that's the way he is. So I want to focus on the law here and the law of self defense. Okay, based upon these three shootings and the reason why is I heard his attorney speaking, and his attorney came out and said, this is a clear case of self-defense. So self-defense, let's talk about it. Um, so Kyle Rittenhouse, 17 years old, accused of shooting three people. The first one, person number one, Joseph Rosenbaum. He's charged in this one with first-degree reckless homicide facing 60 years. And, and the story here, Michael, according to the criminal complaint, is that Rosenbaum is following and approaching Rittenhouse. Now, Rittenhouse has his gun, you know, you know he's got the, the, you know, hanging the gun around his neck, and he's been walking around the streets with it, um, pointed down. But Rosenbaum approaches him, and according to the criminal complaint, Rosenbaum um, is trying to take the gun away from Kyle Rittenhouse after throwing something at him. So, uh, Michael Ayala, looking at that... Again, we're avoiding the other issues in this case, which is a 17-year-old with a gun. But let's just look at straight-up self-defense. If I have a gun and someone is coming at me trying to take my gun and is throwing stuff at me, 
uh, and I end up shooting, is that or is that not self-defense? Well, Vinny, let me just start off by saying the scenes of that little makeshift militia out in Kenosha was some of the most chilling things that I've ever seen in my lifetime. That, that vision of a, of a dystopian America um, was chilling. And, and I know many of my friends, <clears throat> excuse me, all professional people, we all felt the same way. It's like, if America's heading in that direction, man, we are, we are in trouble. But to get back to your question, um, it's an interesting question. Um, because quite frankly, if he has a right to carry that gun, um, he has a right to protect himself with it. Uh, he was being threatened. Uh, someone was trying to take his possession. And if he can argue and convince a jury that he felt threatened to the point where he felt his life was threatened, although I think that would be a, a real question, um, then he would have a right to shoot. So could he argue that? Is that viable? I think it's absolutely viable. Will it win the day? I'm not so sure. All right, let me add another alleged fact to it. A according to a witness, Rittenhouse is trying to get away from this guy, and he gets backed into a corner. So he, th this man is active, the, the victim, Joseph Rosenbaum, is actively pursuing the 17-year-old and going after him. How much does that change the equation versus they just happen to meet in the street where Rittenhouse is attempting to get away from this guy? Yeah, he's fleeing. There, there's no question. It looks like he's fleeing something. If he's fleeing this individual, I don't know. There's an allegation he shot someone uh, prior to their confrontation. So maybe he was just running away. Well, there's. Uh, let me break it down. Okay. Let me break. Roosevelt was the first oh, he's one. The this first is guy. the one that, okay. this is the first one shot. This happens in a parking lot, not in the street. That's not the one we see on video. That's not the one that is clear gotcha. on the video. This one, there's a there's a video from a, from a, from a distance. Uh, that we sort of see what's happening, but there's other videos out there that get pieces of it. Um, so let, let's move on to the second one, though, because I think I think it's important to go there. So now, after he shoots Rosenbaum, according to the criminal complaint, he then um, calls someone to tell him that he just shot someone, but then starts to leave. And as he leaves, he is um, getting away from the scene and running towards the, or walking towards or walking quickly towards the police line, the line where police are. And he's going towards police when there's a group behind him that starts pointing him out, starts threatening him. He starts to move quicker. Someone comes from behind, hits him in the head. He then veers off to the middle of the street and then trips and falls. And when he trips and falls, he's approached by Anthony Huber, who is the second person shot. He's shot and killed Anthony Huber. Anthony Huber is a skateboarder, had a skateboard in his hand. And according to the criminal complaint, there's, there's, he's grabbing, Huber is grabbing the gun with one hand, and, and uh, Rittenhouse is getting hit by the skateboard with the other hand. And now Huber is shot and killed by Rittenhouse, who is able to keep control of his gun. Does that sound like self-defense? If you've fallen in the street, there are a bunch of people approaching you, and one of them comes, again, grabbing the gun and assaulting you with a skateboard. You know, just taken in a vacuum, it, it may look that way. But one of the things about self-defense is you can't create a situation that requires your self-defense. And there's an argument to be made that this community had seen what he had done and was trying to apprehend someone who had shot someone in their community. So in that context, when you look at it, that this guy created the situation, he then does not have the right to turn around and shoot someone who's trying to apprehend him or someone who's trying to contain him or contain the threat to themselves or to the community. So you can argue that if you take it in a vacuum, yes, it may look like these people were attacking him and he was just protecting himself. But there's a question as to whether he created that situation himself by his previous actions. And these people were responding to that. So, again, it's not a clear cut case for me of self-defense, but it certainly is something that may be argued and it clearly is going to be argued by the defense. And it just depends on how a jury sees it. All right. The third person shot is Gage Grosskreutz. And this is after Huber. And he's shot in the arm. He has survived. OK. And according to the complaint, he then approaches Rittenhouse. Um, the, the fact that's a little different with Gage is he has a handgun in his right hand. He gets shot. The charge is there. First degree attempted intentional homicide, 60 years. The charges for Huber, by the way, first degree intentional homicide. He's facing life in that one. 
So if now you're on the ground, you've been approached by one person who hits you with a skateboard, and now someone's coming at you with a handgun in their right hand, is that self-defense to fire your weapon? Well, self-defense for who? I mean, the person coming at him might have been trying to defend themselves, too. You've already shot two people, so they're trying to defend themselves. And again, I just have to go back to the, to the same sort of standard we have for self-defense in that uh, you can't create a situation that then requires you to respond that way and then call it self-defense. So if, again, you're looking at this situation and you say this, it was created by the actions of the young man himself, the 17-year-old with that gun, um, everything that flows from that. Which actions are you saying? The shooting of Rosenbaum? The shooting of Rosenbaum is one that I think is a little bit more in question because- No, no. What are the actions that you believe- Yes, the initial should... shooting of Rosenbaum. Yes. The initial shooting okay. of Rosenbaum, okay. which was witnessed by a number of people in the community. And they're saying this guy, they're trying to point him out, at least to my viewing of the video. They're saying this guy shot somebody. What did he do? Because they're What if they're threatening they're screaming, him? What if they're threatening him? They're screaming, get him, get him. And right. then somebody else says, what did he do? And they say, he shot somebody, he shot somebody. So they're, they're going after him as a result of that action. So again, but by the time the third guy approaches him, again, he's already shot two more people. So you have to remember the situation is continuing from that first shooting. So all of that happens in a continuum. So when we look at it, we have to know that those people are responding to something. And I'm not sure he gets the right to claim self-defense under those circumstances. Let me throw something else at you here. Do you think race plays a role in his case? Because I, I think they're all the same basic race, kind of close to me in terms of the way they look. We know what the protests are all about, but do you, do you think in a case like this, race has anything to do with it? Oh, yeah. Race has, to, has something to do with every case within the legal justice system. There's no question in my mind about that. Um, and it's interesting. It's an interesting point you make that I think the people he shot were all white. And, you know, uh, I, I don't quite understand that whole thing. And it's probably a discussion for another time. But that's a, Yeah, that's another podcast. Yes, that's a discussion for another time. We've got two Absolutely. more that are coming out of this one Absolutely. for sure. But yes. I'm looking forward, you know, I'm looking ahead at the, at the trial because there's going to be a trial because I don't think either side is going to is going to bend here. I think the defense is going to say this is this is self-defense and we can prove it. And prosecutors say, no, we're, we're not giving you a deal. We can't give you a deal in this case. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's time to have the trial. And I'm wondering how that plays. Yeah, I, I only I only have to take you to a few minutes further down on that video when he's walking by the police officers with this semi-automatic rifle around him, young boy, with his arms up, and the police roll right by him. And again, just a shocking image. Why not, if you know there's shooting going on, why not detain him and make sure he wasn't involved in some way? But no, they saw him as on their side. He was part of that militia that the police, at least reports are, they were shaking their hands, giving them water, and they were seen as helping the police. So when this person goes into a courtroom, the system is going to see him the same way. It's going to see a black man one way, and it's going to see the white man as the other. This kid, they're not going to presume he went into that situation to shoot and kill people. They're not going to presume that when he went into that situation, he was a dangerous person with this gun. No, he was a good person. You already see it in media reports. They're showing him cleaning up graffitis off the wall and doing all these other things. And whereas it had it been a black defendant, we're going to learn about how he had a drug arrest back in 1972 or something weird like that. So absolutely, the system is going to see this as a different situation. They're going to approach it as a much different defendant than if he were a black man. And that's just the way our system works. And it's part of the reason, Vinny, why there's marches going on. The system from its inception has not been formed to benefit people of color. In fact, it was formed to control people of color. And that has not changed. People want to dismantle that system, the police system, the justice system, and build it back up again from a new foundation. Because you can't just layer on top of a racist system, a few trainings and a few different things, and expect that system to change. They understand that for real change, it has to be dismantled and then built up again. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you know why Michael Ayala is back at Court TV. Because he's super smart, super passionate, and uh, a great addition to be reunited reunited 
Michael Ayala, Vinny Politan, back together on Court TV. Michael, great to have you. Thanks so much. We'll do it again for sure. My pleasure. It was it was fantastic. Have me on soon, please. All right, folks. When we come back, I've got a little bone to pick, just with with, with everyone involved in all this stuff now, and and it's about transparency, transparency, and I still don't understand why information does not come out quicker. It's like the like. We're doing everything like it's 1995, and it's not. It's 2020. It's a different world. It's time for everyone else to catch up. For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. During the investigation following the initial incident, uh, Mr. Blake admitted that he had a knife in his possession. Uh, and DCI agents, that's the Division of Criminal Investigation, uh, recovered a knife from the driver's side floorboard of Mr. Blake's vehicle. Uh, a search of the vehicle located no additional weapons. All right, so that's the uh, the Attorney General from Wisconsin giving some cryptic details to the public after riots had ensued, after buildings were burned down, businesses were destroyed, and, oh, yeah, a few extra people got shot in the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right? Too little, too late. And, and it is way too little, by the way. Uh, and what I'm talking about here are investigators, prosecutors, police chiefs, commissioners, mayors, whoever is in charge of all this stuff in the different jurisdictions where these things happen, being transparent and understanding the world that we live in today. Everything happens very quickly. And the results are very drastic. And what I'm talking about are police shootings, okay? Let's start with the world of police shootings. Because guess what? Another one is going to happen. And another one is going to happen. And another one is going to happen. And they're going to be recorded on video, whether it's a cell phone or wherever it comes from, they're recorded. But especially the cell phone ones. After they're recorded, you know what they are? They are uploaded and posted, and then they are shared, and then everyone has them, and then everyone reacts to it, and they react to these videos that have zero context, but then the context is filled in by the rumor mill and misinformation and wrong information and maybe some facts that are right, and all along... As people are reacting and protesting and demonstrating, and in some cases rioting and burning and looting, we hear prosecutors and police chiefs talking about, well, the case is under investigation. We cannot comment on anything. What do you mean it's under investigation? We've seen the video. I mean, it's out there. It's not a secret. It's not a secret. And and this whole line about it's under investigation is, is old school. This is what we did, and I say we because I'm a former prosecutor, for years. Because we didn't want to taint the case. Because if there are criminal charges, we can't, we can't taint it. Well, when there's a viral video, there's taint everywhere. Okay? But it's, it's, it's without any context. So here's the problem is that there's a reaction to these shootings and the videos of these shootings. And those reactions often cause more problems, more crime, more harm. In some cases, more death. And the job of law enforcement, whether it's the AG, the prosecutor, the police chief, whoever, is not only to investigate things that have happened, but to prevent additional and future harm and crimes. And when there's rioting in the streets, there are crimes taking place and there is harm taking place. And as we saw in Kenosha, there is additional death taking place. And when these videos go out there, and there is no context placed around them, people will fill in the blanks however they want, 
And guess what? Police will not get the benefit of any doubt. The presumption will be that they acted unlawfully and the reaction will be what we have seen. We need transparency. And it begins with body cameras in every department, big, small, medium. Doesn't matter. This could happen in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It could happen in your town. Okay? And as I said, police shootings will happen. Release the information that you have. For instance, in the, in the Kenosha case, was there a 911 call? Why were police there? If there's a 911 call, that's a public record. Release it. And you heard the, the, the attorney general talking about the knife and then not giving us any context about where the knife was, when the knife was, was brandished. Nothing. Just there was a knife. What does that mean? That means nothing. That tells me nothing. That raises more questions. And the longer it takes for the version from police to become public, the more skeptical the public is. Because what's their reaction to the delay in the release of information? Oh, they're, they're getting ready to cover themselves. You know, they got to get their ducks in a row. They got to get their story straight. So even when they do release information, it is received extremely skeptically. With the technology that we have today, and with what is happening with social media and viral videos of these shootings, it is absolutely the duty of law enforcement to not only investigate the shooting, but to do everything they can to provide transparency to what happened so people understand what happened. So in a case where maybe the shooting was obviously justified, and I'm not making the call on any of these cases right now, I'm being hypothetical, but let's say there's body cam footage that clearly shows that something was justifiable and puts it in a different context, this stuff should be public and should be public immediately. They owe that to us. They need to adapt to the world we live in. Have they been watching? I hope so. I hope you've been watching Court TV. I'm on every night from 8 to 11, not just here on the podcast, but actually on television. If you have a digital antenna, folks, rescan that antenna and you'll find Court TV. And don't forget to check out the show notes, folks. We have lots of links to uh, information on CourtTV.com and other places in the show notes. So uh, check them out. That's it for this time. I'm Vinny Politan. Have a great week. And as always, don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.